A, because he's an economist, but secondly, because he was a leading figure, and still is a leading figure, in the, um, the writing and the definition of regulation for the telecommunications industry in the United States of America. So all of the very early work done on bandwidth allocation, auctions, and so on, he was the leading figure in that space. And of course, we'll vi visit these facilities. Some of them you saw in the videos. So the Woodside Innovation Center, the CAVE, the Institute of Railways, Maintenance Technology Institute, and of course, Sensi Lab. And then we have the Monash Friends and Fieldwork. So what will happen at lunches, particularly on Tuesday and Thursday, is that we're going to invite in about 20 Monash colleagues that you will be paired up with over lunch. It'll be a little bit like speed dating. You know what I mean by speed dating? You go to a party and you talk to someone for 20 minutes, half an hour. It's going to be a bit like that. So you're going to mix and mingle around the room. And then after lunch, if you're persuasive, and I think you will be, you'll ask them to take you somewhere on campus, take you to go and see something that's novel or different. And then what we hope that you'll do is that then you'll then go and look for other people just to go and have a chat with. Okay? So we're not going to organize everything, not by human design, by human action. So your actions are going to be what takes you ahead. And at the end of the day, I'm going to ask you, how many people did you speak to? Two, three, four, five? I think last year we had one guy who spoke to 10 people in one afternoon. 10 people. Yeah. Fantastic. Right. Without further ado, we've got two minutes to talk. Um, ben, would you start? So I'll briefly give an introduction. Ben Aptate, ben Aptate is a good friend of mine. He runs a, a consulting firm called SPP. And SPP does a lot of work with our group of eight universities. He does a lot of work with Monash. He knows Monash incredibly well. He knows stuff about Monash that we don't know about Monash. Um, he, he also uh, went to the same high school as I did uh, years and years ago, although he was much younger and I didn't know him at the time. I knew his dad. Um, so without further ado, Ben, over to you. Thanks, Edward. Can I pop some slides up for you? So I thought I'd start with a question. Um, Edwards asked me to paint a broad brush of the higher education landscape in Australia. And I thought I'd start with a question to you, which is, if you think about your time in universities, what's the single biggest reform that government has delivered in India that's impacted the education system. Give me one. Now, when you say going for the project, when you say the system. Yeah. So yeah. even the education area, we have all the students they have learned only theory and that. But now even in the UGC and A C C, they want to implement the child specific system, which most projects are hands on experience. So in that way, students at the time of completing their education, they can get some more industry kind of thing. So, uh, an investment to ensure people have greater industry engagement and capability. Yeah. Uh, recently, government has bought an accreditation. Mm -hmm. That means that every institution has to be accredited. It is not at all compulsory for that. And because that's sort of a selfless luxury to each and every institution. And why do they do that? Because they want to make all the universities at the whole level yep. to compare themselves as well as to compare with other universities. Yep. Yeah. Yes. The, the government is uh, focusing on the quality of the education. So there's a general <coughs> focus on quality. So any any other yeah, example? More uh, emphasis on skill development rather than mm -hmm. just education. So, so these are really useful um, insights for probably what I'll try and talk to over the next 10 or 15 minutes. So, so I get up every day and I have, and, and I, I grab a newspaper um, in Australia where we're quite lucky, each newspaper 
now typically reflects one political agenda or another. So if you want a conservative view, you pick up the Australian. If you want a slightly left-leaning view, you pick up the age. The... But I read something, and every day there's something on our education system. And the reason that I mention that is because I think that um, the way that the Australian education system has been shaped over many, many years is largely political. There's a tension between uh, return on investment, where you say, what am I getting for the dollars that I put into it? You also say, actually, equity and access, and making sure more people can study. And there has often been, in Australia, a tension between those two um, aspects. So, to be able to talk about the Australian education system, I first might talk about the Australian political structure. So we have six states and two territories formed under the Commonwealth in 1901. We were established by an act of the UK Parliament. Uh, there are a few quirks, but generally you could say the Commonwealth Government, the, the, the federal government, the government of the country, is responsible for defence, border protection, monetary policy, budgets, postal services, all of that more recently was privatised, uh, and immigration and citizenship. The states and territories, so six states and two territories, they do the rest. Education, health, transport, basic services, picking up your rubbish, registering you as a uh, a citizen in your local uh, constituency. Uh, they also, states also look after agriculture and land use. So the way that we're set up is fiscal and monetary policy and budget, largely done federally, but many services delivered by state. I'll come back to that because it's really important. So what about education? Uh, we think <coughs> in really three categories. We talk about early, early childhood and school. So K to 12, kindergarten to year 12. And then post-secondary has got two parts. Higher education, which covers universities largely, um, some theological colleges, uh, but mostly universities and vets vocational, so uh, training institutes um, uh, and, and TAFE, so tertiary and further, so technical and further education. And university entrance, so if I'm a student, as Ever was talking to earlier, if I'm a student in a school, I study like everyone does, I get grades, and then at the end of my year 12, I get an ATAR, which ranks me on a percentile from top to bottom in the country. And then I'll apply, usually through a so, so ATAR is national, it's quite recent. Uh, before that, each state had their own tertiary admissions ranking approach. We now have a, a national one. There are some challenges with it. But then I apply through a state tertiary admission center to go to a university. Or I can apply in some cases direct to that university. Three quarters of all students in the Australian system are domestic, domestic students. Um, there's a significant growth in off-campus study. So now I think 25 to 30% of all tuition hours are done online or, or remotely. Uh, but still there's a very strong reliance on physical campus presence. In 2014 to 15, Australia surpassed 1 million students studying at any one time. 
<coughs> and that's grown now to nearly 1.4, 1.5 million, I understand. It's very hard to, to get an accurate estimate of it. So with all of that context, so we're federally funded, we're state delivered, you gotta work hard, get a good grade, you apply into a university via a state admission centre, um, and roughly three quarters of your colleagues will be domestic students. Broad brush. Hang on one sec. When you applied from one state to the other state, you were, was there a difference for that state university students or that state students or is it common to everyone? Very common to have, um, uh, very common to apply into different states. So if you're a student, some students choose rank of course or institution first. But a lot of students choose the place that they want to study first, the city. So we get, for example, if you looked at, if you talked ethnographically, if you talked to many Tasmanian students, they would often choose to go to Sydney or Melbourne or cities and then choose the institution, which is different to a lot of students that would choose domestically. But many students travel around Australia to study, absolutely. Please, I'll come to that. Uh, and it's changed a lot over the years. Uh, can I come back to that one? Sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, the first question was like, uh, suppose I am from Tasmania, I go to uh, Sydney, then do um, you have any reservation to the state has taking students from other states? Any like uh, reservation? 30% from other states, 70% from local, anything such a reservation? No, each university chooses the students that it takes. So, I'm gonna go back 100 years quickly, and then we're gonna talk about the last 30 years in a bit more detail. So at the turn of the century, between 1886 and 1905, there were six universities in Australia. Um, there was low demand. Not a lot of students studied at university. Those that did were typically in the professions, law, medicine, for example. Um, by 1914, there were three and a half thousand students. 1939, 14,000 students, so very low growth, very low growth for many years. In 1948, so between 1939 and 1948, the number of students more than doubled in seven years. <coughs> Four more universities were added, including Monash in 1958. And interestingly, there was large parallel growth in state-funded, post-secondary, non-university education. So a lot more students studying training and technology. Um, and it's interesting, 1957 for me is one of the most important dates, which was where Keith Murray, who was the UK Commissioner for Education for a long time, he did a review and he decided, or he recommended rather, that government take control over post-secondary education. So four more universities were founded, including Monash in 1958. The other recommendations from the Murray Review, increase spending, establish a university grants committee so that we could make sure that the right research was being funded, very familiar story, and establish a university commission to oversee the universities. Within four years, we decided that a binary system was right. Universities and the technical and further education or the vocational. And to a degree, that, that still exists today, although it's, it's undergone some changes in um, 
in the way that it's funded. So how similar does this sound to you? Is this a, is this a comparable story to yeah. India? Because in my Almost. It, it, it covered UGC theater. Same time, yeah. They would pay to US too. So what drives so what drives a change? What drives this behavior? Fast forward, 1988. There's a re reform called the Dawkins reforms. And you should you should actually test at least Peter Marshall on how the Dawkins reforms changed the way that universities are operated. Because he was in, he was uh, moving into government uh, just when the reforms were happening. So he can talk quite knowledgeably about it. But essentially the Dawkins reforms said, we want equity of access. Any student that wants to study should be able to study in a university. We established HEX, H-E-C-S, Higher Education Contribution Scheme, which was a way to help students pay for their education. Um, I've skipped over a little bit of detail. University education was free in Australia for a while, but it cost too much. So part of Dawkins was to establish HEX to allow students to take out a, a small loan and pay it back over a longer period of time. So 1988-1989 also had introduced introduction of the unified national education system. And that meant that in addition to having control through funding, the government would enter into compacts, contracts with individual universities, with each university that said, how many students are we going to teach? How much money are we going to allocate to you? In many cases, research grants were also funded that way. So they were funded by agreement at that time. Fast forward a couple of years, 1998. So guess what happens? Guess what, what happens when you say, everyone who wants to come can come, and here's a way to pay for it, for the student. What happens? Costs go up, because you've got more students studying. Government looks and says, hang on. We're paying so much for education. What about health? What about community development? What about infrastructure? And they look across and say, well, what are the priorities? So another review. The West Review said, increased tuition fees. And the first university productivity dividend was instituted. That basically said, we assume that a university is going to get more efficient and effective so we required to pay us a little bit back. So 1989 was the first introduction of direct Commonwealth funding for higher education institutions. And then 1998 was the start of the productivity dividend. Um, and I think there's a really good question, which is when you decide to grow, how do you make sure you can generate sufficient surplus to continue to reinvest in your, your university development in your, in your core business? That'd be another one to ask Peter Marshall. So 2005, a few things changed. Commonwealth Grant Scheme was introduced. Fee help commences. So it was a change from HEX to fee help, which essentially meant that the private market, the private providers, the non-university higher education um, participants, the MUHEX, could also take students who are funded under fee help. Fee help is very simple. You're a student, you want to study at my university. 
It costs ten thousand dollars. You don't have ten thousand dollars. You take out a loan from the government and you only start paying it back when your salary is I think fifty-seven thousand dollars or more. At the time it might have been a bit less, forty-three, forty-five thousand. So it's a zero interest loan. What's the problem with that? That's right. So at the time, the average Australian <coughs> salary was below that threshold. So you have a big loan book that never gets paid back. <coughs> Next important review, Bradley. The Bradley review is very important context for Australia's success. Bradley Review recommended demand-driven funding. It was a Labor government policy. Julia Gill, no, sorry, Rudd then Gillard at the time said, we want 40% of all school leavers to be university educated. It was the first time that someone had said, we have a goal. Bradley Review said, well, demand-driven funding. So what that meant was universities competed directly for students. So if a student wanted to study at Monash, Monash could offer them a place and let them draw down on a fee-help loan to study there. If that student wanted to go to Federation University, Federation University could do the same. So the idea was, let the student choose. Let the student decide the quality of the institution, the course that I want to do, the employment pathway way that I would like to see. If they want to go, let's let them. So that had further expansionary pressure on the Commonwealth balance sheet, on the, on the debt. There were some minor changes to discipline funding clusters at the same time, which did have an impact for um, both education and research. Three years later, and this is important, Lomax Smith Review, 2011. So <laughs> between 2000 and 2010, Australia's international student numbers were relatively low. We had the GFC in 2008-9, we had Bradley Review that set a benchmark, a goal for participation in the system. We had many domestic students choosing their courses. We had many students not paying back their, their loans. So we needed a way to pay for the system. Yeah. So how much the government uh, was under public GDP directly? Uh, I think it's about 4% um, at any one time, but I'm not sure what the default rate is. It's dropped a lot recently. Um, so Lomax Smith said, let's establish an international student ombudsman and let's expand our international student profile. The most important the most important reform in my mind, in my opinion, was the night review of the International Student Visa Program. So in 2010, 2011, Australia made it very easy to come here to study and to stay for several years after your study and work. So you could come, study and work after your degree. This has been a competitive advantage, in my opinion, for Australian universities for the last 10 years. In 2014, the Kemp Norton Review looked at the demand-driven system and suggested some changes. Rebalance the government student contribution. So there was a recognition that the amount the government was contributing was probably too high. <coughs> Norton also suggested 
partial or full deregulation of the system. This was one of the most politically charged events in the last seven or eight years because it put the universities at a crossroads. All universities have had relative autonomy to make decisions about how they invest their money. For a high performing university, and this is now, this is my opinion, this is not, this is not Monash University policy. In my opinion, a high performing university like Monash could survive very well as a fully deregulated institution. It would be the master of its own destiny. It could create, it could invest, it could create surplus, it could reinvest that surplus. <clears throat> the problem was though, that there were many universities that would not be better off under deregulation. They would disappear because they would be outcompeted by better, more efficient and more effective institutions. So partial deregulation. So full deregulation wasn't going to work. Partial deregulation might. In the end, 2014-15 budget extended some very minor changes, but they're important. They expanded the demand-driven funding to sub-bachelor, so sub-degree, diplomas, and so on. And also to private providers. This was a significant increase in borrowing to study in Australia. So beyond the university system, it's also extended to, um, to privates and deregulation to CSPs. And in 2017, the government increased fees for Commonwealth supported places, looked more to performance driven funding. So trying to fund the universities for at least a portion of the funding based on how they're performing. Against student outcomes, against research performance, against graduate employability. Um, and they put in place an indexation for fee help to try and combat the amount of borrowing that would not be, that would not be paid back. So where do we find ourselves now? I look at our system, and it would be good to stop for some questions now. I look at our system, I think we have a very strong international and domestic higher education system. We've seen consolidation of some providers, organisations like Monash. Monash doubled its student load in 2001 by merging in three teaching colleges. Double to 35,000 students. So we've been quite successful at merging and, and integrating. I see the challenges now are certainly around our international exposure. We're very exposed uh, to China, as you can as you can see from the very few students walking around this campus at the moment. Um, I see that we're still quite fragmented. We haven't found a way to invest in focus in certain areas. You'll see quite a few universities in Australia will all do the same thing or similar things. Um, and I would say that the big opportunity for us is about how we engage internationally and, and partner um, because we are a long way away. Uh, we're hard to get to. Um, and albeit easy to study here, um, and quite easy to stay. So, if I map the last 30 years, and I'm happy to leave the slide just so that you've got a few, a few milestones, um, but really you'll see our passage has been increase equity, let more students study, provide a way to pay for it, because a lot of people can't afford to study here. Well, it's costing us too much. What do we do? Let's try and make the universities a bit more accountable. Demand-driven funding. 
let's try and step out of control a little bit and let the students decide where they're going to study. Full demand driven system, significant international expansion, 25 to 30% of the sector, international students will pre k Demand driven systems not working quite as well. Maybe we should deregulate. It's not gonna work. So we now have our higher education reform package of 2017. Some time for questions. So how much percentage of uh, funding is actually based on international students? It varies. It varies by institution. Um, Monash, for example, uh, how much percentage is that? Yeah, probably 30, 30 to 40 percent. <coughs> because in India, we have a reservation of 15 percent intake of foreign students. Any institution, they take 15 percent of yeah. intake, of overall intake. And does an international student pay the same? As a domestic student? No. Higher. Much higher. Much higher. Five times more. Five? Yeah, here it's not as much. Probably two. Two to three times. Two to three times the, the, the student fees. Yeah, two to three times. Yeah, yeah. Not quite five. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Monash, uh, 2.2 billion. 2.2 billion in revenue. 2.2 billion. So Monash would be Australia's largest university by student number. So Monash is Australia's largest and most international university. So it has uh, yeah, 2.2 to 2.4 billion dollars in revenue each year. Uh, approximately 75,000 students. Uh, and for town Indonesia, Monash has just announced a, a, an international campus in Indonesia, uh, but Monash also has campuses in Italy, at Prato, uh, in uh, Malaysia, <laughs> Kuala Lumpur, and at IATB camp in uh, Bombay, and recently closed their South African campus. Um, no, it's a campus. What is the teacher student ratio of this university? Sorry? What is the teacher student ratio? I don't know. Like in India, uh, one, one teacher is 15 to 20 students. Yeah, my guess would be 1 to 25. Yeah. 25. That's a guess. I'll, I'll confirm. What is the teacher student ratio? Actually, I'm counting uh, professionals. Yeah. I'll check. I kept track of time. How many professional teachers they are recruited in the university? Maybe how many teachers they are training? Maybe how many, how many they are vacant? So Monash has a uh, an intent that uh, academics do research and teach. Uh, there are some. Um, there are some teaching focused academics or, uh, or teaching only academics, but, but many, many also do research. How did you maintain the quality teaching? Because each one is getting personal. I think that the, um, so most universities in Australia have been established with the addition of, they used to be called CAEs, so Advanced Education Colleges, Colleges of Advanced Education. Um, there were eight universities in the 60s and 70s that were founded. We call them the, the, gum, the gum tree campuses. So there was an idea that having universities in regional locations um, would be good for those communities, so there were in Griffith, Newcastle, Wollongong, um, Deakin was established then, um, uh, Murdoch, so, so, so those universities were established as university only, uh, 
like most other universities, including the group of eight, have had teaching college m colleges merged into them. The way that they've maintained quality is to integrate those colleges into a clearer strategy. Um, bearing in mind that for most of this period, up until Bradley, universities would sign agreements with the Commonwealth. In fact, even after Bradley, probably 2012, 2013, the university would sign an agreement with the Commonwealth Government around what are we going to teach? How many students are we going to take? What fees are we going to commission? So there was, there was quite, there was, there was a lot of uh, Commonwealth Government control over the university operations. It would, it, it's like the government was signing off on the university strategy. That doesn't happen usually. It does with several lower performing universities still have this sort of intervention. But in the main, for an institution like Monash, um, when it wants to build a new building, typically if it wants to borrow money, needs to get the state government's permission to do so. Um, the federal government is largely funding the student places and funding the research. All the universities is under the act? No, we have one international university and one private university in Australia. Um, the others, the, the, we, we have many, I think last count was 100 and Seven, um, yeah, uh, uh, RTOs. So, um, sorry, RTOs that are able to confer degrees. Most of them confer in partnership with the university. So there are there are quite a few that work with universities in in partnership. Monash is publicly funded or like private. Monash is publicly funded. So it's a public institution um, with at any time 30 to 35 percent of its student body are international students um, on, on higher fees um, and the balance are domestic domestic students. Monash offers significant scholarships um, both to international students and to domestic students um, and Monash has a very strong desire to have um, have a significant impact on its community. So you'll see when you talk to um, probably Arvid Khan and also to Peter Marshall, you'll hear a lot more about Monash's investment in its local community, trying to connect to connect the community back into the campuses. And what about the student uh, loan debts? Basically, do they owe a lot of money? Like in the US, uh, they have trillions of dollars which are owed by the students. So they have taken out the loans and not able to pay that. Do you have a similar concept? <coughs> It's not as significant as in the US, uh, but in our view, it's as in, in SPP's view, it's presenting a significant risk. Um, the, the amount of money that won't be paid back. The fees are typically, the listing is typically limited. How much is this? So how can you look at it? It's like the largest of the students. Nine thousand. Nine thousand pounds. Is there a dedicated school for the highest pay? We're very similar to the UK in, in proportion. Um, so it might cost 20, 20 to $25,000 a year for a domestic student and two to three times more for an international. Very similar. Yep. <coughs> yeah. That means the uh, Australian universities are earning quite a bit of money from the international students, like a few billion dollars per year. Absolutely. Uh, so, so, so the coronavirus, for example, uh, my firm has estimated conservatively the impact on the sector um, if students are not allowed back within the next three weeks there's about 1.2 million direct impact for students so that's and obviously that would be much more significant if it's uh, if it extended beyond that so so we are um, we have a great international student market 
it's it's good. It's been it's been incredible for the last ten years, not nine years, and it's funded a lot of our growth. Uh, we are also quite exposed to some risks.